It's September 2023, and although the sky is still light, the nights have already been drawing in faster. Birds are soaring across the grey-blue twilight, and you can probably hear in the background the sound of church bells. Our village church is ringing its bells to call its congregation to evensong. I've taken a walk around a little back lane and approached the church from the fields. A beautiful walk which makes me think of our ancestors leaving their agricultural work and gathering together for hymns and prayers. Not a great deal has changed, especially the ringing of the bells to summon the faithful to worship. The sonorous metallic chimes echoing from the church tower through the village send a message. Come in and be welcome. Peel patterns range from a complex polyphony of multiple bells to a simple single toll. But there's something very special about the sound. In times of trouble, of course, bells have been used to sound the alarm rather than this peaceful ringing. They've called forces to muster and rung out for celebration. We hear them at christenings, weddings and funerals. They're part of the soundscape of the traditional cycle of life. Today's story has a bell ringing at the point of its steeple, and it's a bell whose ringing means the difference between life and death. So let the bells gently summon you, and gather close around the fire and listen in. Welcome to the Three Ravens podcast. There were three ravens sat on a tree, down a down, hey down a down. Were as black as they might be with a down. One of them said to his mate, Where shall we our breakfast take with a down, dairy, 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 down, down? Hello and welcome to episode 23 of the Three Ravens podcast. I'm Eleanor Conlon and I'm gazing into the still waters of a quiet pool where no fish swim and I'm joined by the shimmering reflection of my co-host Martin Vaux. Hello. Do you think I'm more handsome the right way round or in reflection? I think the right way round. Well, thank you very much. (laughs) We're well and truly getting stuck into early autumn in the Three Ravens Mm -hmm. Nest. We've been enjoying lots of leafy walks, blackberry picking, and this week I even tried my hand at chutney making for the first time. Yes. We managed to grow these beautiful, glossy tomatoes, which have obstinately remained bright green. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, we've been having pretty odd weather because it's also been really hot hot at times. I just don't know what the tomatoes have known what to make of it. This yeah, summer. well, I don't know what to make of it. <laughs> but we're the real winners because now we get to eat delicious green tomato chutney. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> as well as dabbling into the wonderful world of pickling and preserving, <laughs> we also released our latest Magic and Murderson episode last Thursday, mm-hmm. which is all about removing curses. So if you or someone you love has been cursed, check it out. And we also got some lovely new Patreon subscribers to thank this week, haven't we? Yes, we have. Thank you so much to Jay. Andy, Gary, Paco and Laura for joining the Conspiracy of Ravens. We so appreciate your support. All hail Jane, King of Patreon. All hail Andy, King of Patreon. All hail Gary, King of Patreon. All hail Paco, King of Patreon. All hail Laura, King of Patreon. If you'd also like to subscribe to our Patreon for exclusive episodes, our monthly newsletter, the Three Ravens Film Club and more, then please head over to patreon.com forward slash three ravens podcast and see what it's all about. So, we are releasing this episode on the 11th of September. What is special about today, Eleanor? Well, I've got a few lesser-known saints whose blessed memory is celebrated today. (laughs) Well, underappreciated saints are kind of our speciality. So, who have we got? Well, the most mythically interesting are St Felix and St Regula, who are the patron saints of Zurich. Okay. They were brother and sister, Felix and Regula, and although they only performed one miracle, it was a pretty impressive one. It's going to have to be, because I think you're meant to perform three, aren't you, to be canonised? Well, this one is cool. Okay. They were beheaded for converting to Christianity in the third century. Ouch. And legend says that after having their heads cut off, they picked them up, walked up a nearby hill, prayed, and then lay down tidily and died. (laughs) Well, happy Saints Day to St Felix and St Regular, (laughs) and well done. I think actually it is a bit of a miracle to not just pick your head up after you've been decapitated, but also walk up a hill and then lie down. I think that's three separate miracles. Don't forget the prayer. Oh, yeah, that's four. I I think they definitely deserve that canonisation, don't they? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) 
Well, in terms of folk celebration, the Chronicle of English Folk Customs draws our attention to the first Monday after the first Sunday after the 4th of September. <laughs> that is a came. direct quote. <laughs> <laughs> and that is when the Abbot's Bromley Horn Dance is performed in Staffordshire. Now, an ancient dance is exactly the kind of thing I like to hear about. So what makes this one special? Well, it is special, actually, because it involves the dancers wearing the only surviving English reindeer antlers from animals brought by the Vikings. Whoa! Yeah, there are six deer men, they're called, who either wear or carry these horns on poles, and they dance through the town, accompanied by a hobby horse, a maid Marion, a boy with a crossbow, (laughs) and various musicians, one of whom is described as a boy with a triangle. Excellent. That would have been me, I think, in the village. Yeah, I bet he makes an astounding (laughs) racket. Good luck to you, boy with triangle. Uh, The dance has the elements of a sort of mock hunt, hence the crossbow uh, being included, and may have traditionally been performed to guarantee a successful hunting season. You can also enjoy accompanying snacks. Ooh, snacks! Abbott's Bromley Wakes Cakes, which sound like nice spiced biscuits. And uh-huh. there's also Abbott's Bromley Brandy Snaps to be filled with whipped cream. Wow, that all sounds really delicious. It is going on today, I checked. So <laughs> if you're near Abbott's Bromley in Staffordshire, it will be well worth a visit. Oh. The BBC also made a documentary about it a few years ago, which will pop on social media so you can have a deeper look if you're interested in the horn dance. Oh, that sounds very interesting. And I was also reading about Wakes Week. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so the horn dance is part of the Abbott's Bromley Wakes Week, hence the Wakes Cakes. Yeah. And these began in the Middle Ages and were originally a religious festival in each parish where people held feasts of dedication to the saint of their parish church. Ah. So they were all different. And most of them took place in the summer months, I guess, to chime with having a nice holiday. But the Abbots Bromley one is a little bit later. They're obviously not really allowed as public holidays anymore Mm. since boring things like the Industrial Working Week (laughs) and the school term got in the way. Yeah, but that's really interesting. I'd assume the term wake to be applied to like a funeral reception like rather than a holiday well it is actually the same term but in in this instance it refers to the holding of an all-night vigil in the church before the public holiday with the usual feasting and dancing began so it's like the vigil over a corpse fascinating well with that shall we dodge the swaying horns (laughs) and tinging triangles of the county criers as they hop skip and jump us into surrey let's Surrey is bordered by Kent to the east, Sussex to the south, Hampshire and Berkshire to the west, and Greater London to the northeast. And we were fortunate enough to actually be able to go this time. Yes, our friend Ben, who you hear singing every episode alongside Eleanor. Uh, singing the Three Ravens theme song, he took us on an amazing tour of some of the key Surrey landmarks. So we were able to experience them firsthand. As we only had one day, we didn't see everything there is to see, but we certainly packed quite a lot in. And as it's so nearby, we can easily pop back and see more of it. Which I think we are going to have to do, because what an interesting county! Yes! The historic county town is Guildford, where we didn't go on this visit. Yeah. But the county's administration has since been moved several times to Newington in 1791, Kingston-upon-Thames in 1893, and then to Rygate in 2021. And we visited Rygate, which is cool. We certainly did, and we will talk more about all the things we saw there in a moment. OK, but hang on. You just said Newington and Kingston-upon-Thames. Aren't those in London? Well, they are now. Oh. It's fair to say that historic Surrey was a lot bigger than modern Surrey, right. as much of it has now been absorbed into London. Ah. It actually used to include parts of South London, which we think of as being very intrinsically London, mm. like Southwark Cathedral and Bankside, oh, wow. which includes, very interesting to me, the Globe Theatre and the Rose Theatre. They were considered to be in Surrey really? in the early modern period. So London yeah. kind of gobbled them up. London spread like a wildfire across <laughs> northeast Surrey, it's fair to say. It only went as far as Vauxhall in the 18th century, London. But then it kept going like a hungry, hungry caterpillar, (laughs) eating up Putney, Streatham, Croydon and Kingston until 1965, which was when Greater London was officially created. I see. Surrey gained back stains and... lucky Surrey. (laughs) What what a phrase. (laughs) uh, And Sunbury on Thames in 1963. But it lost Gatwick Airport in 1974, which is now in West Sussex. Blimey. So it seems as though poor Surrey's boundaries have been subject to a certain... 
degree of elastic thinking, we might say, by various <laughs> British governments. They have, and I was hoping that the county motto might reflect that. Yeah. But interestingly, there are actually a number of different mottos adopted by the various different Surrey Borough Councils. I see. But I like this one of Beddington and Wallington Borough Council. Per ardua ad summa, through difficulties to the heights. Ooh, that's apt and perhaps just a little pointed. <laughs> <laughs> the county flag, however, is a very striking blue and gold check, mm. which must have made the Earls of Surrey and their men extremely easy to find in battle. <laughs> Aim for the blue and gold ones, lads. <laughs> yeah, well, this particular jaunty colour scheme comes from the flag of the de Warren family, who right, were yeah. historically Earls of Surrey. At, but it continued to be used even after the de Warrens died out in 1340 as there is a poem written in 1627 about the men of Surrey carrying the flag into the Battle of Agincourt, which took place in 1415, in honour of the late Earl. And I'm sure they looked absolutely fabulous while doing it. Well, they might have needed a bit of flag-based reassurance, as I read that there was a rather unflattering nickname for people from Surrey in the Middle Ages. Oh, go on, tell me more. Well, they were known as Surrey Capons, because Surrey was known as a place where chickens were fattened up for <laughs> London meat markets and uh, the rather cruel comparison was made between oh, the people and these fat chickens. So the people of Surrey are fat chickens. Yeah. That's a bit rude, it isn't is. it? It is. Although we get called silly Sussex, so yeah, I'm not sure that's much better. Enough. So tell me about Surrey's history, Eleanor, because I'd say I know very little. Well, we know there was a pre-Roman settlement in Surrey, but even then the borders were a bit wibbly-wobbly. The area was home to the Atrobates tribe, who had their centre at Caleva Atrobatum, which is modern-day Silchester. Okay. That's confusing because Silchester is actually in Hampshire now, not oh. Surrey. Oh. <laughs> so it seems as though the Atrobates controlled a pretty large area, including the southern bank of the Thames, so okay. right up in south, what is today South London. They were known to have various tribal rivalries and intermarriages with the Katu Valuni, who controlled the north bank of the river. Yeah. Things changed when an actual war broke out between the two tribes, and the Katu Valuni defeated the Atrobates and took the area. But King Verica of the Atrobates managed to escape to Gaul, where he grasped up the Catavalluni to the Romans in 43 AD. Yeah. Now, this is important, isn't it? Because I'm guessing the Catavalluni seriously regretted their decisions based on what I know of history at this time. They did, because, of course, the Romans invaded Britain in 43 <laughs> yeah. AD. But the Romans didn't seem initially that interested in much of Surrey. They had a larger settlement at Southwark and a few smaller towns, and they found remains of temples at Chiddingfold, Farley Heath and Titsy. So it's probable that there were smaller settlements across the area. Yeah. And it's pretty rich in barrows and hill forts, mm. mostly Iron Age, um, and remains have been discovered at St Anne's Hill in Chertsey, Dry Hill near Lingfield, St George's Hill at Weybridge, Holmbury Hill, Hascombe Hill, and quite a few more. So, I mean, I remember that there was a really, really important battle that, or set of them that took place around the Thames, and then the Romans kind of went east after that point in time. What happened to Surrey after that? Well, the Saxons really brought it into its own during the 5th and 6th centuries. Okay. And it's been suggested there are a couple of tribes operating in the area, the Godhamingus in the Godalming area and the Wokingus in the Woking area. Mm. And it was also possibly part of a larger Middle Saxon kingdom. That seems quite likely. Yeah. But in any case, it was disputed territory for years between the surrounding tribes. Surprise, surprise, Mercia held hey. it for a bit. But it eventually got absorbed into Wessex in 825. Oh, now, like the 850s, not yeah. a great time. Just in time <laughs> for the Danes to arrive in 851. So basically everyone has been fighting over Surrey, it seems, from more or less the earliest records we have. Yep. <laughs> you think its position would kind of keep it safe from the worst of Viking coastal raiding. Mm. And that is true to some extent until a huge fleet of Danish ships sailed up the Thames and crossed into Surrey. Amazing. But the West Saxon army of King Ethelwolf brought that to a bloody end. I was really interested in the sheer numbers involved in this conflict. 
It's called The Battle of Aklea. I've never and heard of it. Nor had I. But when I think about earlier armies, yeah. I think of really small numbers. Yeah. But the Danes brought 350 ships on this occasion, Ooh. carrying over 15,000 warriors. So I think Athelwolf must have had a pretty significant force to beat them back. My goodness. Well, I know that when Julius Caesar first attempted to invade England, there was said to be 50,000 uh, that met him on the beaches. Yeah. And that initially repelled Caesar, who then returned the year after. But a bit like Caesar, I'm guessing the Danes did not give up. No, the Danes did not give up, certainly not at that point. Um, <laughs> we've still got invasions during the reign of Ethelred the Unready and, of course, the conquest of England by King Canute. Now, Ethelred the Unready, we haven't talked very much about him no, in we haven't. the past. And his name is fantastic and quite interesting but in case you don't know he was a saxon king with pretty terrible luck yes. basically <laughs> although the unready part has been slightly mistranslated mm. it's actually a weird kind of saxon english pun because ethelred means noble or wise counsel while unread means bad counsel or bad advice so the name is noble counsel no counsel but Ethelred, the poorly advised, doesn't trip off the tongue quite so readily. No, it say. doesn't, does it? <laughs> now, Eleanor, I've got to confess, a vested interest in the Norman <laughs> conquest. When do my ancestors get involved and start smacking people around in Surrey? Well, so soon after the Battle of Hastings, William's forces advance into Surrey and basically wiped out its native rulers and replaced them with his own friends. It's a bit of a strategy, wasn't it, of Billy the Conks? Yeah, exactly. Bring in your mates and establish them in castles. Mm. And that's where the de Warrens come in. Oh. In 1088, William de Warren was made Earl of Surrey and Guildford Castle was established by the Normans. In fact, they, they built quite a lot of fortresses to help them maintain power over the grumpy English. Well, you know, that's the best way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Something Surrey is really famous for, however, is its connection to King John and Magna Carta. Yes. Now, we saw some things to do with that on our visit to Reigate, actually. We sadly didn't get to go down into these atmospherically named Baron's Caves under the town of Reigate. But the story goes, if I remember rightly, that the Barons met up there to put Magna Carta together before making King John sign it. Yes, it's unverified, but it's a great story regardless. <laughs> yeah. And Magna Carta was certainly signed in Surrey, though, at Runnymede. And we were able to visit the site of Reigate Castle, which was captured during the Barons' War and built by William de Warren. Sadly, there's not much to see now except for a lovely public garden nice and there's garden. the remains of the bailey and the outer wall and a rather interesting castle-shaped folly built by a man named Richard Barnes in 1777. Well, let's not forget also the way down into the Baron's Cave from the middle of what used to be the castle, which is an incredible pyramid. Yeah, it's a, py a stone pyramid with a little door. It's amazing. It's very a, intriguing. Took a picture of that on, on social media. Uh, it's worth saying that the sign proclaiming that Barnes built built this little folly with his own money is almost as big as the folly itself. It's yeah. like such a, a humble brag. He really wanted people to know he paid yeah. for that folly. <laughs> <laughs> we do have plenty of real castles in Surrey's history, though. Excellent. As well as Rygate and Guildford, there's Farnham Castle and, of course, there's Hampton Court Palace. Now, that is an incredible and very special place. I've been back to Hampton Court many, many times and always seem to find something new and interesting to find there. It's a very special place, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. And it's, it's now part of Greater London, of course, mm. but it was in Surrey when it was built in 1514. Well, started in 1514. Yeah, it took, it took a longer long than a year to, to build, to build yeah. it. And it was the home of Cardinal Thomas Wolsey, mm. the chief advisor to Henry VIII. <laughs> <laughs> well, famously, Henry started to take a bit of a shine to the fabulous palace. Yeah. And as Wolsey became less popular, felt his hold slipping. Mm. He actually gave the king Hampton Court to try and rebuild their relationship. And it became one of Henry's favourite places to live. He loved it. Yeah. Expanded it further, but uh, sadly, Wolsey never got his popularity back. No. And because it's been expanded so many times, it's actually a really interesting blend of architecture from various centuries i love all the different sundials and clocks that they yes, have the astrological uh, oh, clock so interesting and there are tudor brick chimneys baroque style pillars frescoes ironwork mm. and i've got to mention when we last visited we found a rather special picture <laughs> well it's only special to like me and us oh, i think it's very special <laughs> well one of martin's ancestors is actually hanging in hampton court in her frame and we were able to visit her a few years ago yeah, there is a portrait of lady elizabeth vaux who was married to thomas vaux the second baron harrodon is he the poet 
uh, he is the poet, and then you've also got like the subsequent generations who uh, were patrons of Shakespeare, which is why you get some Vaux's in Shakespeare plays. And then, of course, they were involved in the gunpowder plot. And that's why I don't have any money. That's what I'm going to say. It's all, <laughs> it's all fault. the fault of the gunpowder plot. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, there are so many interesting historical places to talk about in Surrey that I could probably keep going all day. <laughs> From Hatchlands Park, where I have been but many years ago, yes. it's an 18th century house with an incredible collection of historic keyboard instruments, which I think if you if you can play the piano, they'll let you play. Wow. I think you have to be able to play. You can't just do chopsticks. <laughs> just go in and jam. Yeah, but it's pretty amazing. So very beautiful. What was that called? Hatchlands Park. I've never heard of it. it. Sounds amazing. Oh yeah, it's well worth a visit. Cool. And then there's Clandon House, Polston Lacey, which is one of my favourite stately homes. A very interesting place with a super interesting history, which I wish I had time to dig into more. Yeah. But I'll leave you something for the next round. Yeah, pop it on the blog as well. Can't Absolutely. We? And uh, there's Losley Park as well. Okay. Very beautiful. But what about cathedrals? Are there any major cathedrals Well, there? Guildford Cathedral is an interesting one okay. because it was actually built in the 20th century. Ooh. It was built in the 30s. Oh. And it's not exactly in the perpendicular Gothic style which you and I admire, <laughs> but it is built from bricks made from the clay of the hill on which it stands. That's which quite I interesting. think it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Well, they had, I was reading, they had a really tight budget for this cathedral, so mm. they had to be very canny about how they did it. But it's really beautiful inside. It's very light and simple, and it does have great high it's I'm, not gothic and style, but it's got that sort of French cathedral. I'm uh, having beauty. like a, a tingle at the back of my brain, and I'm thinking maybe like a bit of random film knowledge, but am I right in saying that the cathedral scenes from The Omen were filmed at Guildford Cathedral? Yeah, they were. Ah! Exactly. So that's that's the cathedral you can see in, nice. in The Omen. Damien was here. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, apparently, Surrey's used in films as a location quite often, probably because it's so picturesque mm. and has loads of lovely churches. Uh, you can spot Godalming and Sheer in The Holiday. Oh, yeah. Classic Christmas film. Mm -hmm. And Sheer Church is in Bridge at Jones, The Edge of Reason and okay. The Wedding Date. So I guess whenever you need to film a pretty wedding, yeah. that's the one you pick. <laughs> Straight to Surrey. Uh -huh. Although I don't think Surrey was actually used in any of the films. J.K. Rowling did set the Dursleys house in Surrey um, in the town of Little Whinging, which unfortunately doesn't actually exist. <laughs> Great name. Yeah, also, Ian McEwan sets books there, including Atonement. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course... Jane Austen's Emma, which is related yes. to a trip that we took yes. while we were in Surrey. We actually went to the amazing Box Hill, yeah. which is the scene of the awkward picnic in Emma, where she acts like a complete... What's it? What's it, a yes. Complete what's it. <laughs> and it is quite a breathtaking view. It's this incredible panorama of the county. Yeah. You look around. I'll put some pictures up on our social media so you can have a look, but... It's an amazing place, isn't it? I mean, it's mm. evidently not a natural form. Like, it has been worked on and built over years, mm. in addition to perhaps being a, a tall hill to start off with. Yeah, it's also the site of the grave of Major Peter Le Billier, who died in 1800 after fighting in the British Army under the Duke of Devonshire. Mm. Le Billier is actually buried upside down <laughs> on Box Hill. So funny. It was like upside down in the soil. Apparently he wanted to be buried upside down because he thought the world was topsy-turvy. With the idea basically being that at the end of days he would come out and be the right way up. Well, I'm not quite <laughs> sure of his thinking, to be frank. <laughs> He's not the only military man of interest in Surrey. Uh, there was also Captain Francis Salvin, who was an eccentric character who loved animals, had loads of animal pets, wild, like otters I've that he trained like dogs. Yeah. And he revived the sport of cormorant fishing. Right. So fishing with trained cormorants to help him. Excuse me, what? I know, right? <laughs> and his, his favourite cormorant friend was named Isaac Walton, after a notable <laughs> author of a fishing book. And um, Isaac Walton was actually a lady cormorant as Salvin discovered when he had her stuffed after her death and uh, you can still see her she's in the Hancock Museum in Newcastle in Newcastle yeah. oh my Isaac goodness Isaac Walton the, the cormorant that is absolutely bizarre and I think counts as folk <laughs> <laughs> now Eleanor I want some devils I want some witches I want some ghosts I want some strange goings on tell me folklore from Surrey what have we got well Surrey is happy to oblige. <laughs> We've got to start with the legend of the silent pool oh, at Newlands yeah. Corner. This is a tranquil lake fed by springs, so the water's crystal clear. Oh, my goodness. It certainly lives up to the name. I mean, 
while we were there, the atmosphere was so creepy and strange, like the hairs all stood up on my arms. I couldn't hear any wildlife at all. There was no fish to be seen. The colour of the water was so strange. I don't know, pretty, pretty special place, the silent pool. Yes, and the legend of the silent pool is that it is haunted by the ghost of a woodcutter's daughter who drowned when she was surprised bathing by none other than King John. Mm-hmm. To preserve her modesty, when uh, the king came upon her, she waded into deeper water, but was sadly out of her depth and drowned. Nowadays, the only kind of drowning which happens at the silent pool, I'm hoping, is the drowning of sorrows, because it's home to a very nice gin distillery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, we enjoyed testing some of those gins. So thank yeah. you to Silent Bull Distillery. Om nom nom. Another watery wonder I have simply got to mention because it really captured my imagination is the Whitley Park Underwater Ballroom. Excuse me? What? This was built by a gambling fraudster called James Whitaker White in the early 1900s. And it is this amazing glass domed room topped off with a statue of Neptune. Accessed by a tunnel and it's underneath the Whitley Park Lake. What? It's amazing. It's privately owned and you can't visit, but oh. daring trespassers have done so anyway and taken some pretty haunting photographs. What so thank you, trespassers. An amazing idea. Imagine having a dance while fish swim past the window. Well, that was the idea, I think. Oh, how uh, cool. And some people probably wouldn't like the idea of partying under all that water, mm. but it's definitely up my street. Yeah. I would love a sea creature themed ball held in an underwater ballroom. That sounds amazing. It sounds a bit more fun than visiting Buckland, which is the source of a tributary of the River Mole called the Shag Brook. Now, you laughed at me for nothing, Day. Now you're talking about Shag Brook. It's nothing like that. <laughs> <laughs> it is named after a monstrous horse beast called the Buckland Shag, Incredible. which uh, drags travellers from the nearby road and vigorously devours them on top of the Shag Stone. Oh, come on, the it's, Shag it's Stone. An actual, <laughs> it's an actual boulder in the brook, which sure, has a blood red sure. vein of iron ore running through it. Well, that Cool. Well, at least it did, until the local priest had it removed in 1757 and driven to Devon, where he chucked it over a cliff. Oh, what a jerk! But it was the last which was then heard of the Buckland Shag, so it was effective, yeah. until a local Morris side revived the legend in one of their dances. Oh, OK, well, we've got to find a video of them for the blog. I think there is one. What a cool-sounding legend, the Buckland Shag. And you've got to wonder if, since that stone was thrown into the sea at Devon, if that's where it now mm, haunts. And Shag is now cantering out of the sea to yeah. terrorise day trippers. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Now, other notable Surrey beasts include a dragon who once blocked the road to West Clandon. Oh, yeah. Fortunately, it was killed by a soldier with the help of his brave dog. OK, Eleanor, we really need to talk about this dog thing. It's not a thing. The dog is man's best friend. <laughs> it stands to reason it would feature in a number of stories. Yes, for all your stories. I mean, listeners... No doubt you will have noticed Eleanor's propensity for including canine buddies in almost all of her tales. A few weeks ago, she was like, and next week, when I write my next story, I'm not going to include a dog. And in the next story, what was there, Eleanor? There may have been a brief mention of a dog. <laughs> well, a dog. today's story does not feature a dog. Well, <laughs> at least it only features for a moment. It's still a dog. Don't distract me. You can see the brave battle of West Clandon on the village <laughs> sign there today, which features the dragon and, yes, the dog. <laughs> <laughs> but if cats are more your thing, there have been numerous sightings of phantom cats in Surrey. Yeah, There's some photos taken by a former police photographer, so they must be reliable. Mm. And in Peace Lake, they found a sample of puma hair. Ooh. And someone also took a plaster cast of a giant paw print into Godalming Police Station. Oh, man, we've had a lot of giant cats on the Three Ravens podcast lately. They're getting to be almost as plentiful as all the different shucks. They are, aren't they? <laughs> big cats, big dogs. Mm. <laughs> Another animal tale is the rather amusing story of Mary Tufts of Godalming, who gave birth to rabbits. <laughs> Excuse me? <Yep>. What? <laughs> In 1726, a young woman called Mary Tofts was startled by a rabbit when she was working in the fields. <laughs> she was startled by a rabbit, Martin. She was also in the early stages of pregnancy and was then after unable to stop thinking about rabbits. Right. When she went into labour, Mary gave birth to various animal parts, including rabbits, cats and <laughs> eels. <laughs> Her case attracted a great deal of public attention, perhaps understandably, with the most learned physicians and midwives of the day attending Mary and the royal family even took an interest. This is absolutely insane. It 
was insane. <laughs> and although that did not stop doctors investigating it, yeah. and also worried cooks refusing to serve rabbit pie or jugged oh, hair no. for dinner. <laughs> But of course, the whole thing was discovered to have been a hoax orchestrated by Mary and her husband and sister. Oh, that sounds like a gross hoax. Mary was prosecuted for being an abominable cheat and imposter and pretending to be delivered of several monstrous births. Mm. That was the actual accusation. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. There's even a portrait of her drawn while she was in prison, to which the artist has rather cheekily added a rabbit. Oh, what a story. I mean, look, I'm all for a side hustle, but even <laughs> as a money making scheme, it seems a little OTT. Yes. How about a nice witch to cleanse your palate instead? Oh, yes, please. I need to breathe. I've been in hysterics. <laughs> well, Surrey's home to the fascinating figure of Mother Ludlam. Okay. She was supposedly a white witch living in or n- near the village of Frencham. The 13th century church in Frencham, St Mary the Virgin, is home to an amazing copper cauldron, which is said to have belonged to her. Yeah. The story of the cauldron is that the devil took a shine to it and pinched it. And Mother Ludlam chased after him, flying on her broomstick to get it back. And the devil jumped to avoid her. Uh Each time he jumped, he created a hill when he landed, heavy. And these are called the Devil's Jumps. And they're a series of three hills near the village of Chert. Cool. (laughs) The devil supposedly got bored of the chase. That ran out of jump steam and dumped the cauldron on Cattlebury Hill. (laughs) And when Mother Ludlam recovered it, she popped it into Frencham Church to keep it safe from oh. any future light-fingered devils. See, this is a really fun variation on the kind of devil-created-the-landscape-here story which has been popping up for us all over England. Yes, the legend is also linked to the Devil's Punch Bowl at Hindhead, Another which is bowl. a valley where the devil supposedly abandoned the chase and went back from whence he came. Mm. There's another story about the devil's jumps, actually, which, which doesn't have Mother Ludlam, and that involves the god Thor, who was supposedly irritated by the devil jumping about to amuse himself and chucked some boulders at him. Oh, I'm always interested when you get the blending of the pagan and the Christian mythology around, you know, landscape. And, yeah, and Thor things. meets devil. Yeah, Very interesting. That's cool. Actually, going back to Mother Ludlam for a moment, you can visit the cave where she supposedly lived. Ooh. It's located in a sandstone cliff in Moor Park near Farnham. Mm. And it's a very picturesque cave with a natural spring. It was turned into a grotto uh, during the Victorian period. <laughs> Interestingly, it's currently home to a variety of bat species, but it's fallen into a bit of disrepair, yeah, sadly. You've got to love a grotto, haven't you? Do you think we've got room for a grotto in the garden? Well, perhaps a fairy sized one. Okay, let's Probably make a not fairy one, grotto. one for us. <laughs> there is a neighbouring cave to Mother Ludlam's, too, which is known as Father Foot's Cave. Father Foot? Yeah, the story goes that Mother Ludlam and Father Foot were neighbours, and all we know except for that, was that they had a baby together. Ooh. And one day, the baby rolled out of the cave, down the hill, and into the river below. What happened to it after that? I'll leave you all to conjecture. <laughs> it's like Moses or something. That's really interesting. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> there is so much to talk about in Surrey, but today I want to talk about the legend of a brave woman who risked life and limb for love. Ooh. It's Blanche Harriet, I mean, and I'll start spinning my yarn right after this. They say that time itself can't be altered, and maybe that's true. But as for the clock which tells the time, well, that's another story. In Chertsey, there once lived a young woman whose name was Blanche Harriet. The meaning of Blanche is white, and I can't say that it was a name which suited her, for she had flaming red hair and courage to match it, and passion which burned like a beacon. Whatever she did, she did with all the force of her being, So it made perfect sense that when she fell in love, she did it in a fierce, all-encompassing manner. Her lover's name was Neville Audley, and he was every bit as fiery and feisty as Blanche. They were a well-matched pair indeed, and everybody had been saying that they should wed for as long as living memory. Blanche and Neville themselves rather accepted their marriage as a done deal too, and in truth, their passionate natures meant that they had already consummated their betrothal under the light of a brilliant red harvest moon. They sneaked home at dawn, long after the curfew bell had sent less bold folk to their beds. Luckily, their families weren't at all opposed, and all were more or less primed for the happy day whenever the couple should choose to name it. Blanche's mother had a dowry chest full of lavender-scented linen for her, and Neville's father had a fat purse of money for him. 
They'd even discussed where they might live in an old weaver's house in the nicer part of town which was then for sale. Everything pointed towards Blanche and Neville living a long and happy life together, full of kisses, quarrels and a tumbling brood of carrot-haired children. That was until everything changed. A great contention broke out between the two noble houses of York and Lancaster. Now, when contentions broke out in Chertsey, they were usually over something insulting said at a family gathering or a borrowed bucket which had mysteriously never been returned. But the houses of York and Lancaster were quarrelling about something much less tangible than a missing bucket, the right to sit on the throne of England. Of course, these noble houses couldn't keep their disagreements to themselves. They needed armies, and so they needed to bring the people into their arguments. They brought in plenty of men from Chertsey, with swords and bill hooks to make a point, and Neville Audley was among them. I've said that Blanche's name didn't suit her, and the colour white didn't suit her lover either, for he fought under the red rose banner of the House of Lancaster, red as his love's hair and red as blood. Neville was eager to go, but Blanche made him promise that he'd ride back to her in one piece. He was practising his sword play and his very horse was stamping impatiently, for he suited his master in temperament and was keen to be galloping into battle alongside his brethren, hooves churning up the mud and eyes rolling back to strike fear into the hearts of the enemy. Off they rode, and that was the last anybody in Chertsey saw of either horse or man for a good long while. Well, Blanche was just worried sick about Neville in her heart, though she never mentioned it out loud. Everybody who met her thought she was even more lively than usual, quick to laugh and bold with a comeback. Of course, those who knew her a bit better saw that her hot temper was quicker to flare up than it had been before, and plenty of her friends were on the receiving end of her too sharp tongue. When they gossiped among themselves, they said that Blanche was missing Neville more than she could bear. And it was quite true, she was. Every evening she lit a candle in her window and burned some fragrant herbs in its flame and she said a prayer to the Virgin Mary to bring Neville back safe and whole. Then she gazed in the direction she imagined him to be and sighed in a way she would have heartily mocked if anyone else had been doing it. Neville was not fighting in the direction Blanche gazed but in quite the opposite one and the battles he was fighting in were all opposite too for everything seemed topsy-turvy. Although the Lancastrians threw themselves into the war with all the enthusiasm and conviction of their Red Rose standard, they were losing badly. That wasn't Neville's fault at all, for he fought ferociously, whirling like a dancer with his bastard sword swinging as fast as light. He was like a smouldering coal in the hottest part of the battle, and he killed many men. So much so that he became known as the Scourge of the Yorkists, and the House of Lancaster praised him as a hero, despite the oncoming tide of success for the House of York. That tide came in at last, however. Edward, son of Henry VI, was crowned King of all England. The Lancastrians kept fighting back, but it was really to little avail. At last, the two sides met at Hexham in as bloody a conflict as the whole war had ever seen. Neville Audley acquitted himself well, sending many a Yorkist foe to the grave. He became separated from his fellows at a misty edge of the field where he came upon a man in the enemy colours with the white rose badge on his chest. Neville saw an opportunity until he realised that the man was unarmed and was kneeling to attend to the lame hoof of his horse. Rather than stab him in the back without honour, Neville sheathed his bastard sword. The man turned and saw this act of charity and he called down God's blessings on Neville's head. They exchanged words for a moment, with the strange camaraderie of foes, where for that short space of time they were just two men, and neither could remember what they were really fighting for. Well, it transpired that the man was one of King Edward's friends, and he knew the way the war was likely to go, so he slipped a garnet ring from his finger and gave it to Neville as a token of thanks for sparing him when he so easily might have killed him. Neville put the ring onto his own finger next to his love token from Blanche and they wished each other well. Ultimately, the House of Lancaster was crushed, of course, and Neville was forced to flee. England was no safe harbour for him anymore, 
what with the price on his head from having killed so many of the House of York's finest men. He knew he must flee to the continent to seek refuge in France, where they were sympathetic to the Lancastrian cause. It would be dangerous, terribly dangerous, for Yorkist soldiers were out searching for him. But Neville knew he must see his love Blanche if he could, and persuade her to come with him to France and start a new life. He was sure that their families would understand. Both Neville and Blanche spoke abominable French, but that wasn't the sort of thing he paused to consider. It was hard for him, travelling back to the county of his birth with men hunting for Lancastrian rebels. He travelled by night, and when he reached Rygate there was a fierce chase through the town, and Neville had to hide in the old baron's tunnels to evade his pursuers. But at last he made it back to Chertsey, and rode as fast as he could to Blanche's home as night clouded the sky. She was gazing out of her window in the wrong direction when she heard the hoofbeats of Neville's horse. She jumped up and ran down to him in her nightdress and oh, they were glad to see each other. Such kisses and embraces and words half angry and half loving were exchanged. Stories of the war tumbled out of Neville and he showed Blanche the garnet ring and told her about the man whose life he'd spared. But then Neville mentioned that they needed to leave for France as soon as ever they could. Blanche, being as impulsive as she was, was all for it and would have even jumped up before him on his horse without pausing for clothes or money or even a piece of cheese to eat. That was when Blanche's garden was surrounded by soldiers. There were four of them and their dog barking furiously and they all drew their swords on Neville. The fight which ensued was furious and farcical both together, with the dog chasing Neville round the sundial while he hacked at the soldiers Blanche climbed the apple tree and threw the hard, unripe fruit down at the soldiers' helmeted heads. Well, the scuffle stopped when the soldiers managed to overpower Neville, but two of them were wounded badly, and the dog lay dead in the raspberry bushes. Blanche screamed and railed and called the soldiers all manner of terrible names, but they read a proclamation for Neville's capture and told him that he was sentenced to die at curfew the very next day, and then they took him away. Some girls would have cried or fainted, but Blanche wasn't much of one for either of those things. She'd tried them, of course, the same as anybody, but she'd found they rarely did her much good, so they weren't worth bothering with. Instead, she walked up and down by the light of the moon, brushing her fingers against the sharp-smelling rosemary, and she thought. By the time dawn had painted the sky pink, Blanche was fully dressed, and she had a plan. Now the Heriots had a friend, Herrick Evenden, who visited them every few days. He was an amiable young man with no romantic interest whatever in Blanche, which was a profound relief to both of them and allowed them to be very good friends. When Herrick rode up to the Heriot house with a feather in his hat bobbing jauntily, Blanche met him in the garden and asked him if he had any plans for the day. Nothing firm, said Herrick, who had been planning to see if she wanted to take a picnic into the forest or go boating. Well, said Blanche, would you mind very much going to the town jail and seeing Neville, who'd been arrested and was going to be executed, and getting from him a certain garnet ring? Herrick was very much astonished to hear that Neville had been sentenced to death so soon after arriving home, but he recognised the determined look in Blanche's eyes which told him to shut his mouth and keep listening. And when he'd done that, Blanche continued... Would he mind terribly taking the ferry to London as fast as he could and showing the ring to the new king to get his pardon for Neville? Although this sounded like a near impossible task to Herrick, who'd never met a king and would have been quite happy spending all his days not meeting one or indeed drawing any undue attention to himself, he found himself being firmly propelled by the shoulders towards his horse and Blanche pressing a bundle of bread and wine into his hands for the journey, she said, and before he knew it, he was carrying out her madcap scheme, just as he always did. Well, the day drew on, and Blanche waited and waited. The sun travelled across the sky until it was high and hot, and still no word came from Herrick or Neville. Blanche walked into the town and pretended to be shopping, while keeping an eye on the jail for any activity. But there was nothing. London was not so very far, especially using the ferry, but Blanche worried as she'd never worried in her life that Herrick would never make it back before the curfew bell. What if the king was away or wouldn't see him? What if? What if? 
the sun continued its journey until it was late in the afternoon, and Blanche began to be truly anxious. One of the soldiers outside the town jail was sharpening his sword, and Blanche began to fear that its keen edge would bite through Neville's neck if Herrick didn't come soon. She waited on the path towards Laylam where she'd see the ferry as soon as it came, and spoke sharply to anyone who greeted her. The sun plunged below the edge of the horizon. At last, a long, painful time later, Blanche glimpsed the ferry in the distance. She couldn't tell if Herrick was on it or not, but she realised with horror that now the light had gone from the sky, the curfew bell would be rung. Even if Herrick were on the ferry, it was half a mile's walk from the landing, and he would be too late. Blanche had to take matters into her own hands. Lifting up her skirt, she ran as fast as she could to the church at Chertsey Abbey. The bell tower was one of the older designs with a separate door into the bell loft. Blanche wrenched it open and began to climb the ladder to the loft. It was dark and cobwebby and stank of bat leavings, but she climbed on. When she reached the loft, she could see the great bell hanging in the darkness with its inscription to the Virgin Mary. There was a narrow balcony around the long drop to the ground below. Without pausing to think, Blanche launched herself at the bell, taking a huge leap and caught hold of the clapper. She swung there, muscles burning and screaming, but she knew she had silenced the bell. Well, when the bell ringers came to do their duty, they reached for the rope and tugged on it as usual, but no sound peeled forth from the church tower. Something wrong with the bell, said one. A bad workman blames his tools, said the other. Pull harder. And so pull harder they did, and poor Blanche was dashed against the sides of the bell and the wooden frame around it and bruised terribly. But still she clung on, silencing that dreadful death knell with her own body. Her red hair streamed behind her as she swung, and still the bell made no sound. Down below, the bell ringers paused in their attempts and went to interrupt the sexton in his prayers to ask his opinion. The sexton, a dramatic sort of person, immediately assumed the worst and that the tower was haunted by malevolent ghosts. Armed with candle and Bible, he began the ascent to the bell tower to exorcise the spirits. This was somewhat slow and ponderous, as he had to keep changing hands with the candle and the Bible. The bell ringers followed behind him, offering encouragement here and there. Although the bell was no longer being rung, Blanche clung on regardless, just in case anybody were to try ringing it again and the soldiers at the jail to take it for a sign to execute Neville. Her arms were begging her to let go, but Blanche told herself she must cling on a little longer if it would prevent Neville's head from rolling on the Abbey Mead. Well, when the sexton found Blanche, he was astonished, and was all for exercising her anyway, until one of the bell ringers recognised her. Blanche explained herself, and the ringers were so sorry for her plight that they vowed they wouldn't ring the bells again today, not even if the new king paid them ten guineas himself and offered them a title. They helped Blanche climb down from the clapper, where she promptly collapsed in a heap, like a quivering aspic pudding. Well, you can probably imagine how the rest turned out. Herrick got off the ferry with the king's pardon, and Neville was released with a hearty handshake and an apology, and he apologised in turn, and about to buy a new dog to make up for the one he'd killed in the fury of his capture. When Blanche regained her strength, she climbed back down the bell tower and was reunited with her lover. They feasted and they danced, and if I wasn't sitting here telling you this story, I'd still be enjoying their hospitality, celebrating their wedding and the bravery of Blanche Harriet of Chertsey. Her legend goes on, and there's a statue of her clinging to the bell in Chertsey Abbey grounds to this very day even though Blanche, Neville and the old Belle have all passed over into the record of time. So, 
Hey, Martin, what do you make of the tale of Blanche Harriet? Oh, well, that was extremely cute. I mean, poor dog, obviously. <laughs> dog dog had his chips. R.I.P. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, there was prospect of a second dog. I mean, you're doubling the dog ratio in the story there. Well, <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> but still, I thought, interesting with the flame red hair, because that's a bit of a meme, isn't it? A bit of a kind of fiery Celtic icon in, in English folklore. Yeah, I'm not sure if there's any uh, record of her really having red hair. Oh, that you was just that inserted was a that one. Well, um, there was definitely a play made about her. And I think uh, on the poster drawn for the play, which I think was a 19th century sure. thing, she has got sort of streaming hair as she swings to and fro on the bell. But I think it's blonde. Well, that was a great image, wasn't it? I was thinking, God, that would hurt. Because those clappers on yeah, those bells Yeah, I mean, imagine being massive. smacked against the side of a bell. It yeah. would really hurt you. So it was a pretty athletic feat I mean, I don't, to cling on. I don't know if many people have climbed up to the top of a church tower to go and inspect the bells, but they're pretty scary places when you go up in an old church. Yes, I've been once and uh, it's not an experience I'd necessarily want to repeat. <laughs> the bat poo is real. Yes, for <laughs> sure. And I think it's very interesting how in the old days they used to use Coins and weights to try and make the clock run or the, mm. the timing work within churches and yeah, clocks. Yeah, like the idea of her manipulating time. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Also, Neville. I mean, obviously, what a great guy. Hero, legend, knight. But um, On the wrong side of history. On the wrong side of history and Neville. Not necessarily the most heroic name. Nevertheless, you might, you might that was his name. <laughs> Nevertheless. <laughs> Well, I thought I'd uh, turn him into a very an action hero, yeah. warrior for the Lancastrian side. I, I find the Wars of the Roses setting quite interesting for this story oh, as well. Oh, for sure, yeah. So is that actually what happened? Yeah, um, yeah. Wow. It was it was timed exactly uh, when Edward came to the throne uh, oh. before the the conflicts sort of all settled down. That's so fascinating, and a person based in real history, like a historical person. Yeah, I think these people did all exist. Wow. Um, and Herrick was supposedly real as well the person that rode to get the pardon lovely and nice for us to have a slightly more cheerful perhaps and brighter story as we've done quite a lot of scary ones we have for some reason this season we've we've definitely had the darker and slightly more mystical haven't we so i thought a brighter tone would be a nice one for this week it tends to be the pocket i reach for the scary story but i think (laughs) it's just a matter of taste isn't it absolutely (laughs) (laughs) so should we talk correspondence for this week yes let's Okay, so we didn't have any new reviews on iTunes or Apple Podcasts this week. That's a shame. Please, if you have a moment, do flap on over to iTunes or Apple Podcasts and write us one. We love to read them. Please do. We're up to 39 or so now. And the more we have, the easier it is for other people to find the podcast. But we have had some lovely messages this week, including from Christopher, who wrote, Discovered your podcast today and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. From Sussex originally, live in Worcestershire and have links in many counties, so lots to digest. And that's very nice. Thanks, Christopher. We likewise heard from Sherry Lynn, who is American, and she posted, as if I wasn't listening to enough (laughs) podcasts, I spent the weekend binging Three Ravens. It's a great blend of history, folklore and storytelling, along with some great acting, and the hosts are just so much fun. If I ever get across the pond, I would love to meet them. Oh, that's lovely. Thanks, Sherry Lynn. Now, in terms of our likers, commenters and super sharers this week, we need to say massive thank yous to Paco across all social media. Thank you so much, Paco. And Elaine, Vivian, Anne, Sarah, Rhonda and the Fairy Folk on Facebook. Emlu2017, Jamie Parnell5, Galeria Malduce, Moosey Lucy and Elm Treese on Instagram. And Nemi of Dark and Macabre, Dream Swarm, Horror Smith and The Script Genie on Twitter. Thank you to those people and to everyone who's engaging with us on social media and being mm. so kind and funny and spreading the word about the podcast. Yeah. Please keep gronking from the rooftops. <laughs> yes, please do. And if you would like to join in and see what we're up to on the socials, then uh, <laughs> do please come and gronk alongside us at facebook.com forward slash Three Ravens Podcast, Instagram at Three Ravens Podcast, or on Twitter via at Three Ravens Pod. So, Martin, where will we be wandering to next week? We are off to the birthplace of Capability Brown, Earl Grey, him of the tea, and once the largest kingdom in the British Isles, Northumberland. And I'm going to be telling the tale of the fish in the ring. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to that. I will get the tea a brewing, yes. Earl Grey, of course. Mm. Until then, while our story's gone that way, we'll go this way. And remember, don't whistle until you're out. Thanks and credit go to the Visit Surrey website, the Roaring Water Journal, the Rygate Caves website and Surrey Folk Tales by Janet Dowling. 
Our theme song is the traditional folk ballad Three Ravens, performed by Eleanor Conlon and Ben Harbour, and our logo was designed by Ollie James Dare. The Three Ravens podcast is a Rust and Stardust production, produced by me, Martin Vaux. Thanks for listening. God sent every gentleman Such hounds, such hawks, and such lean man With a down derry day